Good morning, Calvary Bible Church family, wherever you are in your homes and gather to watch on live stream. I want to greet you in the name of the Lord. You know, to, uh, to make uh, social distancing work, we're going to need to make it bearable, especially for our children. So I want to begin by doing something I promised my own kids I would do. Normally, when I begin a message, I greet the congregation. You know, greetings in the name of the Lord. Isn't it great to gather here together? Can I get an amen? Amen. Okay, supposedly that is called a Naruto run. So, kids, I did it, and uh, I have no idea what I just did. <laughs> but really, uh, all joking aside, uh, the empty pews in front of me remind me that it is a joy and a blessing when we are able to gather together. I don't know about you, uh, but I'm already missing all of you. Our Sunday services are like a big family reunion where we get to see our grandparents, our parents, our brothers and sisters, nieces and nephews, sons and daughters, and a bunch of cousins and grandkids, all one big spiritual family. And we probably all took that for granted, didn't we? You know, one of the lessons I'm sure the Lord wants us to learn from all of this is how blessed we were to be able to gather together. We have been truly blessed, Calvary Bible Church, to be led in worship by our phenomenal choir and our praise team, to have nursery care for our little ones, such excellent kids programs and youth groups, and to have so many other blessings that we have enjoyed week by week by week by week for so long without hardly thinking about what a blessing and a privilege it really is. It is true that you don't know how important something is until it is taken away from you, and that is my hope for our congregation, that you are already realizing how much you truly love one another, and therefore how much you already miss one another. I hope you're already longing to be back together in person for a joyous homecoming service in the Lord's good timing. And we are praying that that joyous day would come soon. But in the meantime, whether that meantime is a short time or a long time, let's make sure we're doing what the Lord wants us to do in a situation like this. Last week, we noted that before we can answer the question, what should we do, we must first define who we are. Today, during our virtual life group at 1030, the pastors will be rolling out our plans for online services and for pastoral care of the congregation during this season of physical separation. But before we talk about what we're going to do, I want to continue our study from last week about what God's Word says in regard to who we are as a church. Knowing who we are will make it clear what we need to do and what we should be doing and not doing during this crisis. So we've been asking that vital question. Who are we? Who are we? Who are we as believers? Who are we as a church? Last week, we talked about four key aspects of our identity as a church. First, we talked about the fact that we are the saved the redeemed, those born again into eternal life through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Therefore, as Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15 taught us, we have been set free from our fear of death. Last week, we also learned that we are those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, as Galatians 5, through 23 taught us, we should manifest the fruit of the Spirit regardless of circumstances. Well, what is the fruit of the Spirit? It's love and joy and peace and patience. That's going to be a key fruit of the Spirit here. Kindness, goodness towards others, faithfulness to the Lord, gentleness, and self-control. Third, last week we learned that we are a family. We are a family. Therefore, as John chapter 13, verse 34 taught us, we stick together and we care for one another in practical and personal ways. Fourth, we are witnesses. 
Therefore, as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 taught us last week, we keep the delivery of the gospel, the good news of eternal life through Jesus Christ, as of first importance, as Paul said, of first importance. We are witnesses. So now I want to build upon those four vital aspects of our identity that we covered last week. And this morning, I'm going to briefly run through six more, six aspects of our identity in Christ for a total of 10. So we're asking the question, who are we? Well, fifth, we are worshipers. That's who we are. We are worshipers. We love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we worship him in spirit and in truth. We are worshipers. Therefore, we will commit ourselves to worshiping in spirit and in truth in our hearts, in our homes, and in the new ways of gathering which this crisis requires for us as a church. I want you to turn to John chapter 4, verse 19. Remember, we studied this in our exposition of the Gospel of John, and Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman, and she says in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she asks him a question in verse 20. She says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. She's referring to Mount Gerizim. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, I want you to notice that the Samaritan woman thought that worship was restricted to a physical location. She thought worship depended on geography, where a person is at. So she asked Jesus, is it Mount Gerizim, as the Samaritans believe, or Jerusalem, as the Jews believed? What's the right place for worship? But Jesus tells her, you got it all wrong. It's not about a place. It's about a person. Jesus tells her that true worship takes place not in a building, but in a human heart. True worship is when we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So it is rightly said that the church is the people, not this building. And we're going to be a church without a building for a while, perhaps longer than we think. We don't know. And being a church without a building, I think, is going to be good for us. It's going to be a good thing for us as a church because it will literally help us to think outside the box, the box of these four walls. Buildings are a blessing if they are used as the base camp for training frontline spiritual soldiers. But buildings become a curse if the soldiers love base camp so much that they never go out and fight the good fight for the salvation of perishing souls. The church is the people, not the building. But when we say that, there is a balancing truth that we need to keep in mind. Think of Hebrews chapter 12. I want you to turn there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 23. The church is called the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Isn't that an amazing description? We are those enrolled in heaven. Our names written down in the Lamb's book of life. He says, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, made perfect. Again, our justification by faith. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. So we know here that we have an eternal inheritance. Now I want you to turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. We read, let us hold fast the confession of our hope, right? Our hope is that we are the church of those enrolled in heaven, names written down in the Lamb's book of life. So let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Then verse 24 says, and let us consider, right, give thought to how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. How vital this is in this time for all of us to be giving thought, consideration to how in these days we can stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And look at verse 25. It says, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Clearly, the regular assembly of the local church is a high priority and a command given to us by the Lord. But notice that there is also a significant measure of freedom granted to us in the application of that command. That term, that verb forsaking, right? Not forsaking our own assembling together. That verb forsaking is in the present tense in Greek. So it's referring to an ongoing or a continual action. It's saying, let's not be continually forsaking our assembly together as is the habit of some. So the present tense of forsaking combined with the word habit that modifies it makes it clear that temporary cessation of the assembly is permitted by the Lord. I want to repeat that. Temporary cessation of the assembly of the church is permitted by the Lord. However, continual or habitual cessation of the assembly of the church is not permitted by the Lord. This is why, as I said earlier, I'm confident that meeting in an online format is biblically permissible as long as it is a temporary measure. Now, how long can temporary be? How long can temporary measures be? How long can we meet online only before we cross the line of habitually forsaking the assembling of ourselves together? Well, here's the answer. The Scripture does not say. The Scripture does not give us a specific time frame. Well, why? Because the Lord knew there would be different seasons and periods in the life of the church. So the fact that scriptures don't give us a time frame means that the Lord has given us freedom to apply this command with wisdom. And so, as we have done from the beginning of this crisis, we will continue to meet or exceed the public health regulations for churches as long as this crisis lasts, whether that's weeks or months, or longer. Here's what I think Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 does forbid. It forbids us from getting into a habit of online church only. A habit that would continue even after we can safely resume physical gatherings. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about having an extended period of time where we meet online only. I'm concerned that after the all clear comes and we can assemble together physically, that some will have gotten into the habit of not coming to church. I'm concerned that attending church in your jammies will become a habit. It's nice for a season, perhaps, and necessary. But I'm concerned that a season of virtual church by involuntary necessity, will morph over time into a lifetime of virtual church by voluntary choice for some believers. We need to avoid that spiritual danger. So I want to exhort you, based on, upon Hebrews chapter 10, to commit yourself now, right now, to returning to a habit of regular assembly when this crisis is over, whether that is a few weeks from now, a few months from now, or even longer. Who are we? We are worshipers. Therefore, we will commit ourselves to worshiping in spirit and in truth, in our hearts, in our homes, and in the new ways of gathering which this crisis does require. Who are we? We are worshipers. 
Sixth, we are the bride of Christ. Who are we? We are the bride of Christ. Therefore, we should be longing and ready for the return of our bridegroom. Turn to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Look at verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. We are the bride of Christ. Therefore, we should be longing and ready for the return of our bridegroom. You know, Jesus throughout his ministry told multiple parables that compared himself to a bridegroom and his church as his bride. And those parables have an eschatological focus. In other words, they point us to what will happen in the end times. Now, you may be asking, do do I think that this virus has some sort of special prophetic significance? The answer is no, and I want to repeat that. No, it does not. What's happening with COVID-19 is child's play compared to what's coming. But here's what I think the significance is. I think pandemics or anything that brings death on a large scale reminds us that we need to be ready for either our own death or the Lord's return at all times. We do not know the day or hour of either our own death or the Lord's return, and so we must be ready. Are you? I think this pandemic should have two spiritual effects on two different categories of people. First, unbelievers should take warning. Unbelievers should take warning and repent before it's too late. In Revelation 22, verse 17, we just read this great invitation. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. You know, if someone right now had the supposed miracle cure for COVID-19, I bet a lot of people would be prepared to pay a lot of money to get just one dose of it. Jesus, and Jesus alone, has the cure for death itself. And the good news is he offers it for free. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes Take the water of life without cost. Take the water of life. It's offered to you through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we said last week, you need to do the ABCs. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus and confess him as Lord. Unbelievers should take warning and repent before it's too late. Secondly, believers should grow in their longing for the return of Christ. If you're a believer, you should grow in your longing for the return of Christ. As Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 says at the beginning, the Spirit and the bride say, come, come, Lord Jesus. And then skip down to Revelation 22, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then the New Testament concludes with the words, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen. Believers should grow in their longing for the return of Christ. Well, why is that? It's because of who we are. We are the bride of Christ, and therefore we should be longing and ready for his return. Seventh, who are we? Well, we are one body. We are one body. Therefore, we must stay united and have the will to live and care for each member of the body. 
If we don't stay united, if we don't have a will to live as a church, and if we don't care for each member of our body, we will not survive COVID-19 as a church. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Again, we're kind of referring back to some things we've studied in recent years. Go back to our study last year of the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, right? This is written in hard circumstances. Talk about isolation. Paul is writing from house arrest. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. You see, the church is compared in this passage to a body, to an organism, a living organism. We're called by Peter living stones. And no body, right, our doctors and nurses would tell us that no organism, no body can survive if there is division and disunity amongst its members. And so we must be diligent to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, I think it is the providence of God that the last two messages I preached from the Gospel of John before all this started was on the topic of judging with righteous judgment. And now we all need to apply those lessons. Suppose you go to the grocery store and you see someone with a huge cart of groceries Lots and lots of toilet paper, I guess, as they would say. And you think to yourself, what a selfish hoarder. How dare he take more than he needs? Maybe you're right. Maybe he's a hoarder. But maybe, just maybe, you got it wrong. Maybe he's making deliveries to at-risk elderly people so that they don't have to go to the store and expose themselves to the virus. Or your employer won't let you work from home. Maybe he's greedy and uncaring. Or maybe he knows something you don't know. Maybe he knows that the business will go bankrupt if he sends his workers home. They'll lose their jobs and health insurance would be lost right in their greatest hour of need. Maybe he's waiting for some of the government assistance programs to come online. Beloved, be careful about being judgmental in times of crisis. A panicking population rarely makes good judgments and rarely sees things objectively. We all get tunnel vision when we hear a train is coming. I want to repeat that. We all get tunnel vision when we hear that a train is coming. But burning bridges in our relationships with each other with our family members, will not stop the train. In fact, it will hurt us from being able to care and love one another when it comes. If that train really hits hard, we're going to need each other. If the worst case scenario occurs, that person you think is so wrong about this may be the only one left to help you. Think ahead. Don't burn the bridges you may desperately need later. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now, there's another key point that I want to make in regard to the church being compared to a body and a living organism. And that's the following. Like any organism, churches in these days will need to have the will to live in order to survive this pandemic. I'm convinced Some churches will never recover from this simply because their people did not have the will to live as a church. 
This was kind of mentioned to me by a good friend of mine, Pastor Dave Hintz, and he told me when we talked this week, he said, I've been emphasizing to our congregation that we will need to have the will to live as a church or our church will be one of the casualties of COVID-19. If we forsake the meeting of ourselves together online just because no one will know whether we really tuned into the live stream or not, we will die as a church. If we stop giving financially, we will die as a church. And the dedicated and talented people on our staff will lose their jobs. Am I trying to preserve the jobs of my staff? Yes, I am. If we lose our unity, we will die as a church. If we stop loving and checking up on one another, we will die as a church. If we stop caring about each individual part of the body, from young to old, and especially our elderly saints, we will die as a church. If the medical system gets overwhelmed and the sick and the dying have no one left to care for them and we as a church abandon our own, we will die as a church. That's why last week I tried to prepare you for the possibility that we may need to be willing to lay down our lives for others just as Christ laid down his life for us. That was my goal last week, to prepare you for that possibility. We will pray it doesn't come, but we need to be prepared. Right now, our doctors and our nurses are doing just that. They are being willing to lay down their lives for others. And in that sense, they are truly heroes and need to be honored by us all and prayed for diligently. But if this virus takes them out or if this health system is overwhelmed, the rest of us may need to step up to take their place and to continue the fight as best we can with the limited knowledge we will have. Trust me, fast forward to a year or two from now. Don't be short-sighted. Fast forward to a year or two from now, and we will be dead as a church if the reality is, as we look back, that we abandoned our own in their hour of greatest need and left our own brothers and sisters in Christ to die alone and uncared for. That will be the death now of this church if we abandon our own, and we will not do that. I think if I asked you if you'd be willing to die for Christ's sake, you'd probably say yes. I hope you'd say yes. But what we fail to realize is that laying down our lives for Christ usually means laying down our lives for one another because the church is his body. As we read last week, 1 John says, if we do not love our brother whom we have seen, we cannot love God whom we have not seen. Who are we? Who are we, Calvary Bible Church? We are one body. Therefore, we must care for our members. Well, who are we? Eighth, we are a holy priesthood. We are a holy priesthood. Therefore, we pray. What does a priest do? A priest intercedes. And we are a holy priesthood. Therefore, we intercede for our nation. We proclaim the excellencies of God. We abstain from sin. We perform good deeds. We submit to the governing authorities. And we do what is right. And you're saying, Pastor Brett, that's a long list. Where would you get it from? Well, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. It says that we come to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. And you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, right? It's not a physical building. It's a spiritual house for a, listen to this, holy priesthood. A holy priesthood. Why? He says, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, 
and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. If you have put your trust in Christ, you will not be disappointed. If COVID-19 takes you and you breathe out that last hard breath, you will wake up in the presence of Christ and you will not be disappointed that you placed your hope and trust in him. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. Listen to verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's what the world needs to see, us doing good deeds so they may glorify God. He continues, verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. We will submit and follow the governing authorities. It's the right thing to do. That is the will of God. We are a holy priesthood. Twice in this passage, Peter says that. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says that we are priests. In verse 5, he says you are a holy priesthood. In verse 9, he says you are a royal priesthood. And those words are addressed to every believer, not just the clergy, That's why we believe, as Protestants, something called the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers. Your being physically separated from me does not cut you off from God. You are a kingdom of priests. What is the primary function of a priest in Scripture? Well, priests make intercession before God on behalf of the people. In other words, prayer, prayer. Beloved, there are many things you cannot do from your home. There are many things you cannot do while faithfully following social distancing guidelines. But what you can always do is pray you can always do is pray. Right now, you cannot go and give that lonely elderly saint a hug. You want to. I know you do. They want you to hug them. I know they do. Right now, you cannot, should not do that, but you can pray for them. You cannot shake the hand of that ICU nurse and thank her, but you can pray for her. So this should be a time in which the church devotes itself to prayer like no other time before it. Devote yourself to prayer, beloved, right there where you are. But I gave kind of a list of things we learned from this passage. Let me just briefly point them out. In verse 9, our purpose as priest is stated to be so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The glory of God is our ultimate purpose. In verse 11, we're warned to abstain from fleshly lusts. Watch out, beloved lest you fill idle time with sinful lusts. Be careful that you do not fill idle time with sinful lusts. 
We are a holy priesthood, therefore we abstain from fleshly lusts. In verse 12, we're told to be diligent in doing good deeds, so diligent that unbelievers will glorify God because of what they observe in us. In verse 13, we're told to submit for the Lord's sake to the governing authorities, to every human institution, it says. In verse 15, we're told to do what is right and thereby silence the ignorance of foolish men. We are all priests, so let's act like it. Who are we? Beloved, we are a holy priesthood. Therefore, we intercede for our nation. We proclaim the excellencies of God. We abstain from sin. We perform good deeds. We submit to the governing authorities, and we do what is right. Ninth, who are we? We are doers of the word. We are doers of the word. Therefore, we will obey all biblical commands while being wise, adaptive, and flexible in our application of those commands. Full obedience, wise application. James chapter 1, verse 22. James chapter 1, verse 22. Prove yourselves in this time, in this hour, in these days, in these weeks, in this month, Prove yourself to be a doer of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. You know, when we're able to gather together physically, it's not hard to put on nice clothes, smile and nod, shake people's hands and sit in pews. Now your time has come to be a doer of what you have heard. And notice that we must obey God's word unconditionally, regardless of circumstances. Obedience is not conditional. There's never a command that says, well, do this unless a pandemic strikes. No, no. We obey unconditionally, regardless of circumstances. Scripture and Scripture alone was, is, and must remain our final rule of faith and practice. What God's word commands, this we must do, even if it costs us our lives. You do realize, don't you, that obeying Christ's commands has gotten lots and lots of Christians killed throughout church history. From the very beginning. Every single one of the apostles except for John lost their lives obeying Christ's command to preach the gospel. Literally millions of Christians have paid the ultimate price to obey the ultimate authority. They paid the ultimate price to obey the ultimate authority. We must follow wherever Christ leads. We must obey. And where would Christ be in a crisis? He would be caring for the sick. He would be caring for the dying. We must follow wherever Christ leads. We must obey. But notice what it says in James chapter 1 in the next verses. So he, James just got done saying, prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And then he says in verse 23, if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. All right? So look, don't be like this forgetful man who just hears it, goes out there, he never goes and does it. Then look at verse 25 but one who looks intently at the perfect law. Be looking intently at the perfect law. The one who looks intently at the perfect law. It is perfect. There's no flaw in that law. He who looks intently at the perfect law. The law of what? The law of liberty. And abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. This is a perfect law, and it is a law of liberty, of Christian freedom. God's word is the supreme authority for the believer, but that supreme authority grants us a lot of freedom when it comes to application. In other words, 
God has given us a brain. He expects us to use it. We are not only allowed to be wise, adaptive, and flexible in our application of biblical commands. We must be wise, adaptive, and flexible in our application of biblical commands, or else we will dishonor the one who made us in his image. And God is pretty smart. In fact, he says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts higher than yours, O oh, man. So our mentality, especially in times like these, must be, and I want you to hear this, unconditional obedience, wise application. Unconditional obedience, wise application. Who are we? We are doers of the word. Therefore, we will obey all biblical commands while being wise, adaptive, and flexible in our application of those commands. Well, tenth and lastly, who are we? We are a hospital for souls. We are a hospital for souls. Listen carefully. We are a hospital for souls. Therefore, we are an essential service, whether the world recognizes that or not. We are an essential service, whether the world recognizes that or not. I want you to look at Luke chapter 5. What do I mean when I say we are a hospital for souls? Well, in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, it says, Jesus went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi. My middle name is after Levi, who is we know as Matthew. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those words written down by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through the hand of a doctor named Luke. It is not the healthy who need a physician, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Beloved, we are a hospital for souls, eternal souls. We have been entrusted by Jesus Christ with the only cure for the ultimate cause of death. Therefore, we are an essential service, whether the world recognizes that or not. So we cannot, and we must not, and we will not just take a break, just go on hiatus, or just shut down. We will change, we will adapt, and we will follow all public health regulations. But as a physical hospital is now gearing up to treat the body, so also now spiritual hospitals must gear up to treat the soul. As a hospital that treats the soul, we are no less important than hospitals that treat the body. They are doing their part to avert physical death. We must do ours to avert spiritual death, eternal death. Dying from COVID-19 is frightening, but dying in your sins is forever. Therefore, sharing the gospel is of first importance. Last week I quoted Pastor Justin. I want to close this week by quoting him again. School may be canceled. Events may be canceled. I'll add here, the public gathering of the church may be canceled, but the Great Commission has not been canceled and cannot be canceled. Now, how we accomplish that sacred mission is going to look different. It can and should change, but what our mission is will never change. Who we are in Christ must determine what we do. 
Well, let's summarize. Who are we? We are. Get back to the slide here for you. Who are we? We are saved. Therefore, as Hebrews 2.15 taught us, we have been set free from our fear of death. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we must manifest the fruit of the Spirit regardless of circumstances, as Galatians 5.22 taught us. Third, we are a family. Therefore, as John 13.34 taught us, we stick together and care for one another in practical, personal ways. Fourth, we are witnesses. Therefore, 1 Corinthians 15.3 taught us, we keep the delivery of the gospel to perishing souls of first importance. Fifth, we are worshipers. Therefore, as John 4.24 taught us, we will commit ourselves to worshiping in spirit and truth in our hearts, our homes, and in the new ways of gathering as a church with which this crisis requires. Sixth, we are the bride of Christ. Therefore, as Revelation 22.17 taught us, we should be longing and ready for the return of our bridegroom. Seventh, we are one body. Therefore, as Ephesians 4.4 4 taught us, we must stay unified, have the will to live, and care for each individual member of the body. Eighth, we are a royal priesthood. Therefore, as 1 Peter 1.5 taught us, we intercede for our nation. We proclaim the excellencies of God. We abstain from sin. We perform good deeds. We submit to governing authorities, and we do what is right. Ninth, we are doers of the word. Therefore, as James 1.22 taught us, we will obey all biblical commands while being wise, adaptive, and flexible in our application of those commands. Tenth, we are a hospital for souls. Therefore, as Luke 5.32 taught us, we are an essential service, especially when people are dying and entering into eternity. And so I want to end with a key verse. Philippians 1.27. I don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. So Philippians 1.27 tells us, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I want to pray that God will give you strength and grace to do just that. Let's go to prayer. Lord, I come before you to pray for my family members dispersed in homes all throughout this community and some much farther away than that. We think of our global partners around the world and pray for them. We pray for our most at risk. We pray for those who are alone, sheltering at home with only you to be their comfort and their companion. Oh, Lord, be with them in these dark days. Fill their loneliness with your love and your joy and your peace. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and dying, Lord, that you would give them the hope of the gospel, that you would heal, and Lord, that this scourge would be turned away from us in your mercy. We know as a nation we have much that we have deserved. May this be a time of national repentance and revival, we pray. And Lord, may we be faithful. May we know who we are and therefore know what we are to do to please you, to love you, and to love our fellow man in these days. It is the greatest commandment that you've given us, Lord, is to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. We pray for wisdom and courage to do that in these days. In Jesus' name we pray.